You ready, Council? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. We open the record in the Iowa District Court for Jefferson County. Uh, we are here on case FECR 005143, State of Iowa versus Willard Chaden Miller. We're here today for a um, motion for a Franks hearing and a suppression motion, uh, both filed by the defense. Uh, personally present today for hearing is uh, the defendant, uh, Mr. Miller, with his attorney, Nathan Olson. Uh, also present is the state of Iowa, represented by Jefferson County Attorney Chauncey Molding and Assistant Iowa Attorney General Scott Brown. Council, it's my understanding that the parties wish to address the application or motion for Frank's hearing first and then uh, proceeded to the suppression hearing, is that correct? Yes, Your Honor. Okay, well, I'll turn it over to you then, Mr. Wilson. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, as a preliminary matter, as um, discussed in chambers, there are a number of exhibits that have been filed under seal with court permission that we would ask or that we would offer at this time. Those are exhibits A, through V, as in Victor, those were filed with the court in March of this year. Um, additionally, um, as discussed, um, exhibits that will be filed under seal with court permission um, are exhibits Triple H, Triple I, and Triple J, which are each transcripts of depositions. Triple K, which is an audio exhibit that will be filed with the clerk and provided to the court and to opposing counsel. Exhibit triple L and exhibits triple M and triple N, the last two being video exhibits again, which will be filed with the clerk under seal and provided to this court. Uh, counsel, any objection to the admission of those exhibits? No, Your Honor. The state would stipulate to the admission of those exhibits listed by defense counsel. Additionally, the state, um, in the event that they are not included within those um, defense exhibits, has what I have labeled as State's Exhibit 1, although I'm certainly willing to change that designation. Um, a paper copy of four search warrants executed in this proceeding, um, as well as what I have listed as State's Exhibit 2, which is a thumb drive containing screenshots of Snapchat text messages provided to law enforcement uh, by Jay. Additionally, uh, the State intends to offer the full uh, video and audio of the interview with defendant Jaden Miller on the night uh, in question and we'll have that um, uh, presented to the clerk report uh, following this proceeding. I will label that uh, State's Exhibit 3. Uh, and any objection to those exhibits, uh, Mr. Olson? Um, Your Honor, as discussed, uh, as long as those exhibits are filed under seal, uh, no objection to those exhibits. State, so, state does not object to filing those three exhibits under seal. So states one, two, and three will be uh, admitted and I'll allow you to file it electronically uh, at a later time. But uh, for now, I will admit defense exhibits A through V and then if there's no objection to the triple H, triple I, triple J, triple K, triple L, triple M, and triple N. I will admit those uh, without ob objection as well. Unless, counsel, did you want time to review those? Well, I'm uh, relying on statement of defense that those are the um, uh, attested to deposition transcripts. And assuming that those are what, what they're purported to be, I think that those are appropriate for consideration. I'm a little confused. What happened to the double lettering? Did we just jump from single to triple? 
Mr. Molding, uh, we offered a, a number of proposed exhibits in the waiver hearing, um, so we burned through a lot of the, the potential okay. exhibits there. Okay. Okay, uh, Mr. Olson, you may go ahead and proceed uh, with the motion for Frank's hearing, whatever you'd like to supplement your motion with uh, that you filed already. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, obviously, this court has the, the motion, uh, which has been filed under seal. Um, obviously, it is, discusses matters that are uh, protected by Iowa Code um, and Iowa Rules of Criminal Procedure, hence the necessity of those being filed under seal. I'm not going to discuss the specifics of the evidence. Um, I will generally point out that our motion is specific regarding the information we're saying that was known to law enforcement um, at the time the four search warrant applications were pre presented to a judge. Information identified in that motion weighs heavily on a finding of probable cause that was omitted. And further, there are misstatements within that search warrant application, those four search warrant applications, that, and those misstatements identify my client as someone involved. The reason we filed this Frank's motion is because law enforcement has to provide under Iowa law all information that they know or should know a issuing magistrate would want to know when deciding whether or not a search warrant application is supported by probable cause. Much information was not provided that should have been told. There were individuals providing information to law enforcement that the magistrate was never told about and was never allowed to determine whether or not that individual should be found credible as a source of information by law enforcement. As discussed, I will be much more specific in the filing following this hearing and talk through the specific exhibits and why those support the motion for the preliminary finding. It's our position that the exhibits provided to the court previously and that have been offered today show at least a reckless disregard on whether or not that information should have been provided or was mistakenly provided in that search warrant application. And as this court is well aware, the standard is either recklessly provided or a purposeful misstatement or omission. Whether or not it was purposeful, that is up to the court, but we have at least passed that initial thres threshold of a reckless inclusion and omission such that a full Frank's hearing should be granted by this court. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, Mr. Olson. Mr. Mullen. Your Honor. Uh, first off, the state would stand by its written resistance the motion for a Franks hearing filed by the state on October 31st of this year. Um, the defense has not met its preliminary burden to establish um, a preliminary showing that any falsehood or false swearing or a reckless disregard for the truth took place in the deputy swearing to the search warrants that resulted in the search of the defendant's home in person the search of his cell phone and computer, the search of his uh, Snapchat records, and the warrant for the cell tower records. Specifically, and this affidavit is, it's short enough that, that it can be, I'm not gonna read the whole thing here, however, uh, paragraph three of the relevant warrants is the principal uh, showing that I think that it is in controversy here. On November 3rd. Your Honor, I object. The, well, the, state I, is a, the state is attempting to read into the record information that has been sealed and has been identified as private. Your, 
Can, can you identify what you're looking at? Your Honor, I'm reading exhibit? paragraph three of the affidavit in question that the defendant alleges is a false swearing by a law enforcement officer. I'm prepared to uh, present that, that document that is in question in controversy and then point to the court uh, a number of points where uh, the allegation of essentially perjury by an officer, a very serious allegation, is completely disputed by the evidence. I, I just was curious if you could tell me um, of the uh, exhibits that we've admitted, which one you're looking at? Uh, this would be, well, from the states, it's States Exhibit 1. It is the sworn affidavit to search warrant. for Chayden Miller's home. And do we think uh Maybe uh, Mr. Olson knows uh, if that's Exhibit uh, G or application would be Exhibit uh, D, maybe. Are you familiar with what Mr. Molding is looking at? Um, Your Honor, the offered exhibits that were filed under seal contain each search warrant application and each subsequent search warrant that was issued. So if I'm not sure of which specific exhibit, but we have four search warrant applications at issue, all four of them are proposed exhibits and all four of them contain what I believe to be the operative language that, that the state is attempting to read into the public record. Judge, these, these search warrants are, are the, we have to be able to read the matter in controversy into the, the record and then discuss this in open court. I, I don't understand where that controversy is. is. This is an allegation, or this is a, a, an attestation, a sworn attestation by an officer uh, as to a part of his investigation involving a interview with an associate of the defendant. Uh, no, and the state can present uh, information about whether the um, information the officer provided was uh, reckless or purposeful. So if you can narrowly, I'll overrule Mr. Olson's objections if you can just keep that to, as a narrow focus. Yes, Your Honor. Um, on a attestation, a sworn affidavit on the 4th of November, 2021, the officer swore that on November 3rd, uh, an associate of the defendant showed that officer messages from Jeremy Goodale, co-defendant of the defendant, Snapchat, that state that Jeremy Goodale and Willard Miller were involved in planning, executing, disposing of evidence related to the death of Nohima Graver. Um, the uh, information outlines in Snapchat a conversation how uh, Mr. Uh, Goodale and the defendant, Mr. Miller, conducted surveillance on Ms. Graber, uh, detailed the manner in which she was killed, uh, where her body was located, where the vehicle was located, and how evidence of the crime was disposed of. Um, it's, this, is the, this is the principal paragraph that I believe um, the defense hangs its, its hat on in its allegation of false swearing by the uh, law enforcement officer. Um, it was also communicated the location of the body um, which had been corroborated by officers. Um, this, this individual came in after Mrs. Graber's body was located. I would draw the court's attention to the audio of the interview with Juvenile J conducted by Special Agent Kedley with the Iowa Division of Criminal Investigation specifically to timestamp two minutes, 13 seconds, where uh, J states specifically Quote, it wasn't just Jeremy, it was two people. It's a timestamp four minutes where the special agent asks if uh, Jeremy did it by himself and uh, the juvenile J answers no. When the special agent asks who was he with, uh, the juvenile J states uh, his best friend Chaven, meaning Jeremy Goodale's best friend. Your Honor, objection again, same objection as before. We're at the point where he is reading these 
the, How can I have an application for a Franks hearing if you, you can't argue the Franks application? Your Honor, the discussion that we had in chambers and the reason that we sealed these exact exhibits he's talking about is to keep them from the public until it's determined whether or not they should be suppressed. The, is this court going to say that the state gets to read into the record the exhibits that this court just sealed? That severely infringes on my client's right to a fair trial because it puts information out into the public which otherwise would be suppressed and never known. Your Honor, defense counsel is trying to have his cake and eat it too. It's alleging that my officer swore a uh, false affidavit, but when I'm at, uh, pointing the court in the direction of uh, validation to that swearing, he's saying that the court shouldn't look at it. Well, it's, uh, the, the objection is overruled. There's no reason to read through, through the uh, okay. search warrant application because I've read it already and I know what's in it. But also, uh, when you file a motion for a Franks hearing, uh, and you have a heavy burden of proof to prove that an officer was lying or purposefully deceitful or reckless disregard for a truth, and we have a public hearing, which is a public hearing, it's going to get out in the courtroom. That's just the reality. So, Mr. Molin, I'll ask you to keep your focus on this Frank's hearing to the narrow subject of whether law enforcement was reckless recklessly disregarded uh, the truth or purposefully deceitful. Your Honor, may I hear very briefly? Yeah. Thank you. Um, I would ask that whenever possible, this court could order the state to identify by timestamp in a general description as opposed to the specifics of the statements made. This court is going to have the audio that the state is referencing and this court will be able to determine without the state's interpretation or my interpretation on behalf of Mr. Miller's, whether or not it was reckless or purposefully untruthful. The timestamp identification in a general statement should be sufficient for this court to understand. I would ask that the court, the court direct the state on that regard. And I believe I did. So Mr. Molding, with uh, what I told you in mind, uh, you can proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, additionally, Jay, uh, JB, along with his girlfriend, Kay, um, the, the question I think that defense counsel is raising here is that there was no uh, causal nexus between the evidence that's presented by, uh, well, that's I'm spilling over into suppression issues, but essentially that the law enforcement officer um, recklessly disregarded uh, the truth when stating in his search warrant that uh, Chayden Miller was implicated in the homicide of Noema Graber during the interview with JB and his girlfriend. And that is presented to the court in the audio that's been in the record. Additional um, um, uh, general statements from that interview that uh, support the sworn affidavit by the officer. Uh, JB states uh, specific with specificity that quote they, and it's really important for the court to consider that all of the, um, the pointing to Chayden Miller in the first few minutes of the, of the conversation then starts to be referred to as they. The they in that entire audio interview is Chayden Miller and Jeremy Goodell. Every time uh, JB and K indicate they, they're indicating Chayden Miller as well as Jeremy Goodell. Uh, JB states that they took her car. Uh, that they, or uh, K indicate, JB's girlfriend Kate states that they, quote, took $75 from her wallet. Um, they, uh, K indicates that they ditched the car in the woods, which was borne out by law enforcement's investigation. Um, and K indicates that the defend the reason why she believes that the defendant did it. Chayden, specifically, indicates a motive. Um, and finally, at, at timestamp 1120, uh, John is asked uh, if, he's talking a lot about Goodale, asks if Mr. Goodale was with Chayden during these incidents, and, and John states yes. Furthermore, there are Snapchat exhibits, which are photographs 
of um, communications contained in States Exhibit 2 on this thumb drive. <coughs> I believe it's clear in the deposition testimony that the court's going to have in front of it that the um, documentation of that Snapchat communication was done but not complete. There, there are missed portions of those communications. Um, the deposition transcripts indicate that Mr. Miller's uh, name came up during the Snapchat conversations. Um, Your Honor, I, I think that uh, the, the motion for a Frank's hearing here fails on a number of grounds, particularly that the evidence that was developed um, by law enforcement both before and after uh, Chayden's execution of the search warrant uh, bears out that search warrant. I think defense counsel is um, mis misquoting the obligations of the parties here. And obviously, a magistrate, or a, in this case, the district court judge that considers a search warrant um, uh, can consider any number of, of things. But it's not the law. It's a misstatement of the law that all information needs to be pre presented to a magistrate um, when considering a application for a search warrant. I would uh, draw the court's attention to paragraph 12 of the state's resistance to the Franks hearing, which sets forth the, the status of the law on that, um, which is that an officer applying for a search warrant, quote, is not required to present all inculpatory and exculpatory evidence to the magistrate. Um, it doesn't constitute a reckless disregard for the truth um, or, uh, or a misstatement if the officer doesn't present the entire case from beginning to end, including all possible leads, all possible suspects, all possible motives, to the magistrate when requesting probable cause for a search warrant. All that needs to be presented to the court is probable cause as to the crime committed and the loca location to be searched and the things to be seized. Um, the state would posit that the defense has not met its burden to show uh, Certainly not a intentional misstatement by the swearing officer, um, and not even a reckless disregard for the truth, as borne out by the preceding and subsequent investigation. Mr. Olson, more uh, record on the Franks matter. Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. Your Honor, as we set out in our, our motion, one of the most important things that was left out was the fact that law enforcement took information from individuals at all. If you read that paragraph in that search warrant, it looks as, as if every single thing that was put in that paragraph came from a Snapchat conversation. If you listen to the audio that, that's provided as an exhibit and watch the videos that are exhibit A, very clearly not the case. It's very clear that these two individuals, not one as stated in the search warrant application, but two were each giving information, were each correcting each other's information given to law enforcement. And it's very clear as stated out in our motion that one of those individuals was at the park on the day of this alleged murder. That is important. That shows that this isn't just some individual off the street. And I would ask this court to pay attention to what law enforcement says to that individual once that information is provided. And the timestamps for the video are provided in our, in our motion. The individual at one point even says that he didn't even read all the statements or all these Snapchat messages. How? can a magistrate make a probable cause determination when they don't know anything about the person providing information to law enforcement. Iowa code requires that law enforcement tell a judge about a confidential informant or a citizen informant, or if you want to use the language provided in the application, an associate. This isn't a magic word that just because they didn't say confidential informant, it's not a confidential informant. It's a person providing information to law enforcement who is unnamed, who the judge is supposed to trust the officer presenting a piece of paper that it's 
credible and reliable. How can a magistrate do that without the information actually weighing on probable cause? With that, Your Honor, I will provide a written map through the depositions and point to the specifics of the sealed exhibits to further support our motion for Frank's hearing. Thank you. Judge, if I could be heard on the matter of the confidential informant. Uh, go ahead. Juvenile JB is a man who heard and saw evidence that a homicide was committed. He, he knew that there was a missing person. He had in his possession, along with his girlfriend, evidence uh, as to the perpetrator of that crime. And he did the right thing. What somebody is supposed to do when they have evidence of a crime is that he went to the police and he presented that information to the police and the police investigated. And tarring him with some, some implication that he is a, a quote unquote confidential informant, he's confidential because he's a child. He's a juvenile. Uh, this, is not, this is not somebody whose identity is being kept secret for the purpose of him ratting on his friends or turning, turning state's evidence because he was a co-conspirator in, in a drug case. This is a concerned citizen doing the right thing that concerned citizens do when they have evidence of grievous crimes. That is going to the police and presenting that evidence to them to attempt to effectuate justice. This is not somebody with a motive or a motivation in this case. So the idea of him being a confidential informant is, is thoroughly misplaced. Uh, counsel, any further record on the Franks hearing? No, Your Honor, not from the state. No, Your Honor, thank you. Uh, and with regard to uh, defendant's motion to suppress, um, I know that any challenges to the search warrant, the defense has a burden of proof, but there was one allegation uh, made uh, for the motion to suppress that I believe the state has the burden of proof on. Counsel, is that uh, your understanding? Judge, uh, I think our uh, resistance addresses at least part of that um, with regard to the warrants and the um, kind of what I would refer to as spinoff issues from those, uh, which we've already argued with regard to the um, status of JB, who we believe is not a confidential informant. But I do believe it's the defense motion on the uh, warrants. Uh, there's certain criteria that apply to that. There is an allegation that the statement that the defendant was making was involuntary. Uh, we would have some short testimony on that to provide you uh, to supplement um, the record here from Agent Ryan Kettle. We didn't, I don't think we discussed this. Uh, Mr. Olson, did you intend on presenting your evidence on the suppression motion first, or did you intend the state to call uh, witnesses first? Uh, Your Honor, I, I would ask that this court um, consider, I think, the exhibits that were filed under seal from defense, as well as those filed by the state, for the suppression motion as well. Um, I think that they're, they're pertinent to both. Um, as far as evidence, Your Honor, um, with besides those exhibits, um, I don't have any evidence regarding the motion uh, or the motions um, for which I have a burden. Um, I do have evidence regarding the involuntary waiver. So it would be my request that the state present their evidence showing a valid waiver and I could present evidence However, I am ready to present evidence right now if the court would prefer that route. Is the state ready to proceed yeah, right we now? We can call Agent Kedley. That's fine with us. Okay. We call Ryan Kedley. Do you promise or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Please have a seat. Agent Kelly, good morning. Good morning. Uh, can you please uh, state your name for the record? Yes, my name is Ryan Kedley, R Y A N K E D L E Y. And how are you employed? I am a special agent within the Iowa Department of Public Safety's Division of Criminal Investigation. And how long have you been an uh, agent with the DCI? Just over 15 years. And you, you do work for the Division of Criminal Investigation, is that right? That is correct, yes. And how long again, 15 years? That's correct. Okay, do you have any other prior law enforcement experience? No, I do not. And uh, just briefly state for the court what your educational background is. 
Uh, I was a 2005 graduate from the University of Northern Iowa, uh, where I received a Bachelor of Arts degree in the field of criminology. Uh, in the spring of 2007, uh, I began studying at the Iowa Department of Public Safety's uh, Basic Academy, which lasted until the fall of 2007 when I graduated and then was posted within the DCI. And what current assignment do you have within DCI? Uh, within the DCI, I am posted to the Zone 4 uh, Major Crime Unit, which encompasses 20 counties in East and Southeast Iowa. Uh, we are by nature a referral unit so that uh, we uh, tend to receive calls from local and county agencies to provide them with investigative assistance for major criminal cases. And over the years of being assigned to the major crime unit, uh, how many different uh, death investigations have you either led or been involved in? Uh, several. Um, if not uh, dozens, potentially over a hundred at this point, uh, many, many, many. And did you become involved in the investigation into the death of Noema Graber? Yes, I did. When did you become involved? Uh, that was on the evening of Wednesday, November 3rd. And were you what is commonly referred to as the case agent in uh, this investigation? No, I was not. Who was that? Uh, that was Special Agent Trent Villeta, V-I-L-E-T-A. And you were assisting Agent Villada as well as other law enforcement here in um, Jefferson County in looking into what happened to Noah McGregor. Would that be true? Yes, that is true. Okay, as, just to cut to the chase here, um, as part of your investigation, did you interview the defendant, uh, Willard Chayden Miller? I did, yes. And when did you interview him? Uh, I believe the interview began at 6.41 a.m. on Thursday, November 4th. And had he been identified to you as a potential suspect in the death of Noah McGregor? Yes, he had. Uh, who identified him to you in that way? Uh, that was the, the previously mentioned associate of Mr. Goodale and Mr. Miller, I, be I believe previously referred to as JB, as well as his girlfriend uh, referred to as Kay. And I know the judge has an exhibit with regard to uh, the interview with JB, but were you the agent? along with others that was interviewing both him and his girlfriend? Yes, one of two agents, yes. So you had received this information directly from him? That is correct. At the time that you uh, interviewed the defendant, um, was it obvious to you and others in law enforcement that Noema Graber was the victim of a homicide? Yes, it was. From what you had been told, uh, whoever the perpetrators were of that homicide, would it have been what you would refer to as a murder? Absolutely. Based upon the injuries and the other information you had at the time? Yes. How was the defendant uh, contacted uh, just prior to your uh, interview of him? Uh, so my interview of the defendant was conducted at the Jefferson County Law Center uh, in Fairfield. Prior to that interview, a search warrant had been executed at his residence and for his person. Uh, at that time, I believe it was Agent uh, Richard Vale of the DCI, V-A-L-E, and Trent Villada, who had in person approached um, the defendant at his residence. And then the defendant was transported via a fully marked Fairfield Police Department unit to the Jefferson County Law Center. Um, I believe that Agents Vale and Valletta then spoke directly uh, with the defendant's mother about the purpose of uh, conducting a follow-up interview with the defendant. Um, I then concurred with those two agents and then was asked by Agent Valletta to conduct an interview of the defendant there at the Law Center. And did the interview, the complete interview, take place at the Law Center? Yes, it did. And how long was it? Uh, just over two hours, I believe. Okay, and generally the times from the beginning to the end of when you contacted the defendant? Um, when I first stepped into the room, I believe it was 6.41 a.m. At around 9 o'clock a.m., um, after taking a brief break, I had re-entered the room and basically indicated to the defendant that the interview was being concluded. The entirety of the interview and your contact with him is recorded, is that right? That is correct. 
Um, prior to uh, speaking with the defendant, did you read him any type of Miranda warning? Uh, Miranda warnings were read to the defendant by agent, but by agent Vale. And you were advised of that? I was present for that, yes. Okay. So you observed it? Yes, I did. And in fact, um, as agent Vale uh, read through the actual Miranda form, um, he advised uh, the defendant to read along with, and I believe the defendant initialed next to certain items, then signed, and then I signed the same document as a witness to it. How would you describe the defendant's demeanor whenever he first came into contact with you? Um, remarkably relaxed. Um, given the circumstances that he was being woken up at his residence, uh, subject to a search warrant and transported to um, a law enforcement location, and then speaking with two detectives from the state police, um, he was remarkably relaxed and spent the better part of the first 20 minutes discussing his issues that he had uh, with Miss Graber and Your Honor, this is getting into again the substance of the specifics that are at issue in the, the suppression motion. Uh, I, I understand that the state has to determine whether or not the waiver is voluntary, but I don't believe the specifics of Mr. Miller's statements outside of questions of validity of a waiver um, are relevant to this hearing. Further, they're subject to the order to seal that we have previously discussed. Mr. Brown, uh, any record you want to make on well, this? Judge, I don't know how we're supposed to address the voluntariness issue without getting into some contact that the agent had with the defendant. I understand they don't want this in the public eye, but we're in a public courtroom and the allegation has been made that the statement and the behavior of the police is outside the bounds of the law and that it's involuntary. How can I address that if we don't get into some interaction uh, with the defendant? I don't intend to go through the entirety of the interview or get into the substance of it. It's recorded, we get that. But the, the officer that engaged with him has to be able to provide the court circumstances of his contact with him, why they did certain things, his observations, his observations aren't on the inter aren't on the uh, audio, only his statements and the defendant's responses to them. So that in order to provide you a fuller picture on this issue, we have to be given some leeway. Briefly, may I respond? To Go ahead, Mr. Olson. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, I understand. Case law is clear. That questions regarding a voluntariness of a waiver are, you know, regarding intelligence knowledge of the individual if they've had contacts with law enforcement or police or the court system before i mean I, I have no issue with those questions it's the specifics of what mr miller was saying to these agents that's outside of those bounds that that's what i'm i'm just asking this court to direct the witness to to stay clear of at least for the purposes of this hearing because that's not relevant well I guess for this specific objection, um, for the answer that uh, Agent uh, Gedley was getting into, uh, I'll overrule it. I'll just, and I think everybody knows um, that the information we're looking for is whether or not the um, statements he gave were voluntary. So Mr. Gailey's observations about um, Mr. Miller being calm or maybe discussing different topics, those sort of issues are, in my opinion, certainly admissible and relevant. Uh, it's probably, it could probably get to a point where it was piling on with um, just bolstering or uh, unnecessary information, but I don't think we're at that point yet. So. Maybe, Mr. Brown, it might be helpful for you to ask another question. Uh, go ahead. I can do that. So in these initial interactions with uh, the defendant, um, you would describe him as calm, is that right? Uh, remarkably relaxed, but yes, calm. Okay. So tell us about the uh, circumstances of the interview. Where, where was it located specifically at the law center, and what was the setup of the room, if you can describe that for us? Uh, if memory serves, and the best re um, representative of the setup of the room would be the 
audio video recording of the interview itself. Uh, but this room was a, uh, a fairly small, I would say eight by 10 uh, dimensional room. Uh, had a table, um, no fewer than three chairs. Um, uh, I was dressed in, in khaki cargo pants, uh, boots, and a red pullover. Uh, my partner at that time, Agent Vale, was dressed in black shoes, black pants, and a charcoal pullover. Um, uh, door leading to the outside, which was approximately 15 feet from the public lobby area. And did you go into the interview uh, with knowledge of other investigative facts that had been learned concerning the death of Noah McGregor? Yes. And had, do you believe that you were fully briefed as to the content of what that investigation would have been? Yes. And have you had conversations with Agent Billita, Agent Bale, and other officers, um, Kinsella and others that would have been working this case? Yes, I did. Did the defendant ever appear to you to be uncomfortable physically or emotionally in any way? Uh, in terms of discomfort, uh, there was a portion midway through the interview where he became very, very emotional. Um, but beyond that, no, there was no level of um, observed discomfort, no. You said the interview lasted approximately two hours, maybe a little more? That's correct. Uh, did the defendant ever ask to terminate the interview? No. Now, you went over this Miranda rights with him, is that right? Agent Vale did, yes. Okay, and that was on a, a, a sheet that were, were, they were printed out? Yes. And you said he initialed those? Yes, he did. Was there any hesitation by the defendant in signing his initials, or did he have any questions concerning what those rights were? No. Did he ever ask for an attorney? No. Did he ever ask for a parent? No. You've reviewed the uh, audio recording of the interview, is that right? It is. Uh, I think you've been sitting here in the courtroom. We know that we've offered that as an exhibit. Is that true? That's true. Uh, does it document, in your opinion, uh, your, the entirety of your interaction with the defendant? Yes, it does. Uh, was there any interaction outside of the room or anywhere else in the law center between you and the defendant that would not have been documented in any way? No. Agent Kedley, thank you very much. Thank you. I have no further questions, Your Honor. Mr. Olson. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, Your Honor, may I approach the witness? Yes. Thank you. Agent Kendall, uh, Kedley, uh, I've just handed you a document that uh, is a sealed exhibit labeled uh, for the record purposes as Exhibit Triple L. Um, Agent Kedley, you recognize that document? I do, yes. Uh, you have a signature on that document, don't you? Uh, yes, I do. That's the Juvenile Waiver of Rights form? Yes, uh, for this specific interview, we use the Iowa Department of Public Safety's Division of Criminal Investigation waiver for juveniles 16 and older. Uh, we believe that it's uh, DCI Form 9. Thank you. And at the bottom of that document, is there a signature that is purported to be of a parent? Yes. Um, you didn't witness a parent sign that form, right? No, I did not. Okay. Uh, who gave you that form? Uh, this was provided to, uh, I think, it, I believe it was brought into the interview room by Agent Vale, who then reviewed it with the defendant, uh, but it was discussed between myself, Agent Vale, and Agent Villada. Okay. And sitting here today, you have no knowledge of any discussion that was held between um, 
the parent who signed at the bottom of that form and law enforcement? Uh, no direct knowledge other than what information was provided to me by agents Vale and Valletta. Okay. Agent Kedley training and when discussing or when speaking with the juvenile, obviously you're trained to try to find their parents, right? Uh, in terms of uh, in this situation, depending on age um, and then also the severity of the crime, typically um, it's, it's usually the case that we reach out to a, a victim's parents uh, for a waiver to speak to their child. Uh, but again, that's somewhat dependent on severity of the crime and then the age of the juvenile themselves. Let me ask a different way. You're familiar with the Iowa code says in certain situations, you have to reach out to a parent before you talk to a, a minor. Is that correct? That's correct. Yes. And in some situations when they're 16 or older, you have to make a good faith effort to speak with the parent as a law enforcement officer. You'd agree with that? Agreed. Yes. And that good faith effort based on your training is you have to let them know that their child is in custody. Right? Mm -hmm. yes. You have to make a good faith effort to let the parent know whatever crime or delinquent act that there's an accusation about, right? Uh, I, I, I can't say for certain. Um, based on my training, again, it's somewhat dependent on, on the severity of the crime when it comes to a juvenile and then whether they're 16 or older or not. Um, we get into the language of forcible felonies and whatnot. Uh, in this case, I do believe that a good faith effort was made to reach out to um, the defendant's mother for the purpose of notifying her that we wish to speak with her uh, child relative to the investigation. Great. Your Honor, may I approach again? Yes. Thank you. Agent Kedley, same sealed exhibit, triple L. In that form, it says the information about the delinquent act or that is charged or that the person's in custody for, right? Like that's on that form. It is on the form, yes. So if you went to a parent of someone who was 16 or older and asked them to sign that form, you, as an officer of, the DC, of DCI, would tell them, tell that parent, what the act is that you're taking their kid into custody for, right? Uh, can you rephrase that question for me? Just so I make sure that I'm, <laughs> I'm being as accurate uh, as possible. It's a compound question, I understand. <laughs> you're going to speak to a parent because you want to talk to that parent's child who is under the age of 18, but over the age of 16, okay? Okay, yes. You take that form that's in front of you, the blank form, right? You take that That's form. correct, yes. Yeah. And those four items that are on top there, listed out, you talk about all four of those items with that parent, right? Well, I certainly present the document to the parent. Whether I read them to the parent or not, I can't say for certain I would do that or if that's required of me, but I would certainly present the document and um, advise them to read through the document before signing. Got it. And it's your understanding that form is created by DCI and because it's supposed to conform with Iowa law? Correct, yes. May I approach and take that exhibit back, Your Honor? Go ahead. Thank you. Agent Kedley, you were in the room the entire time that Miranda and that form was discussed with Mr. Miller, right? I was, yes. And you've reviewed audio and video. All those interactions are, are recorded, correct? That is correct, yes. Okay. And so anything from your recollection, if it's maybe a little bit different from on the video, you'd defer to the video, right? Absolutely. And. Have you reviewed the video? Is there anything that, uh, regarding that Miranda discussion that you don't recall or that you think is, is different from your recollection? Um, I reviewed the, the video at least once, not recently. I've reviewed the audio more recently. So again, this is my best recollection, but the audio video would be the best representation of what occurred inside that room.
at some point, uh, you were asked to, to end the interview with Mr. Miller, right? That's correct. And that was it an agent who came in and said, hey, I need to speak with you, and you left that room? That is correct, yes. And it's your understanding during that conversation with the other law enforcement officer that that a parent had asked for the interview with Mr. Miller to stop? That is my understanding, yes. And, and recollection, excuse me. And, and your recollection is you came in and then just said, hey, parents said time to stop and you're done. Is that your recollection? More or less, yes. And approximately, would you say that you had been speaking with Mr. Miller for about two hours at that point in time? Give or take, yes. And it was around, I, I think you said around, around 9 a.m.? Just before, I believe, but yes, okay. uh, around 9 a.m. Okay, and obviously timestamps on the video, at least runtime is going to tell for sure, right? Correct. Do you happen to know whether or not the timestamp on those videos is accurate? I, I don't know. Um, I did a fairly good job of documenting times within the narrative report that I authored um, after the conclusion of the interview. I believe the narrative report was somewhere in the range of 12 pages, and so uh, I did as best I could to make sure that those times are noted. But when you reviewed the, the video, there wasn't any glitches or jumps, like the time ran consecutively to what you saw. Correct. Not the, no glitches or jumps that I observed. When search warrants were authored in this case, did you speak with the juvenile identified as Jay? Were you in that room? Yes, I did. And did you stay in that room or were you going in and out of that room providing information to other law enforcement officers? Uh, I had stepped out of the room at least once. Um, near the beginning of the interview of, of Jay and his girlfriend. Just, we can just talk about what, whether you were in and out. I was in and out at different times, yes. Thank you. And were you providing information to um, the individual who was authoring search warrants or was that Agent Vail? I believe it was both of us actually. Okay. And did you have an opportunity to review those search warrants before they were ultimately taken to a judge? I don't believe I did, no. Okay. So but you were providing information to, to them at different times? Yes, I was. And to them, of course, I mean the author of the search warrant applications, right? The affiant, yes. Uh -huh. And you know other law enforcement officers were too? I believe so, yes. Do you have a recollection of how many photos of Snapchat conversations were collected during that interview of the juveniles identified as J and K? Uh, I don't have a specific number, but it was numerous. Are you talking 5, 20? I'd say somewhere in the range of somewhere between 8 and 15, give or take. Okay. And again, that interaction was audio recorded and at least partially video recorded? I believe so, yes. During your interactions with those two juveniles, they identified names of certain Snapchat accounts, you'd agree? Yes. Neither you nor Agent Vale went in to look for phone numbers or emails that were associated with those Snapchat accounts, right? By went in, what do you mean? That was a confusing question, thank you. You did not look in those juvenile cell phones that they had with them to determine whether these Snapchat accounts were associated with a telephone number or an email, right? You didn't do that. No, I personally did not do that. Um, there was at least some portion of the time where I was speaking directly with one of the juveniles while Agent Vale was um, working with the other juvenile about the um, uh, transition of these Snapchat uh, screenshots to him. And so to what extent he did any of that, I don't know. I certainly did not, though. Yep. Um, thank you. And that was, that was still in the same room. You were just talking to sit people in the same room, right? Correct. Okay. And did you have, well, okay. 
We talked about the audio recording of that, of that interview, and that's a complete recording of your interactions with those two juveniles, right? I believe so. There may have been some introductions between myself and the juveniles in the lobby of the Jefferson County Law Center that may not have been audio recorded, uh, but certainly uh, the lion's share of, of the most content being shared was audio recorded, yes. And it's your understanding that there's video recording, but it didn't quite capture all of that interaction, right? In the lobby no, area? No, of the interview room with J and K. It's your understanding there's a partial video recording, right? I believe that's correct, yes. But obviously, have you reviewed that partial video? Uh, yes. And again, anything that you've recalled or testified to that's different from those recordings, you're gonna to defer to the recordings, right? Correct. To your knowledge, both sitting here today and at the time that you interviewed Mr. Miller, he had no prior interactions with law enforcement, right? Uh, not that I'm aware of, no. And that's the sort of thing that as a DCI agent you'd look up when you're interviewing someone? Uh, ideally you would, but not in every instance because every instance is, is certainly different with the circumstances. Um, in this chance, I, I did not have a chance to do a uh, quote unquote deep dive of Mr. Miller's history. Um, but I believe I had um, spoken briefly with local law enforcement into whether they had had any previous dealings with him to which they indicated they had not. No further questions, Your Honor. Mr. Brown? Um, Agent Kedley, the exhibit that you've been provided by the defense uh, is the waiver uh, that you utilize uh, in this case, is that right? Yes, that is the waiver that was utilized for this case. Okay, and with, it incorporates what I'm going to refer to as the standard Miranda warnings, correct? Correct. It does say at the top of it, waiver for juveniles 16 and older, correct? Correct. All right. But incorporated within, and my point is, it would be the standard Miranda warning that you would give to anyone who was going to be potentially subjected to custodial interrogation. Would that be true? Yes. All right. That's all. Thank you. Anything else, Mr. Olson? Nothing further. Thank all you, right. Your Honor. Thank you, uh, Agent Gedley. You can step down. Does the state have any more witnesses? No, no, no further witnesses. And um, just to confirm, Mr. Olson, were you planning on calling any witnesses? Yes, Your Honor. Um, if that is the case, um, would the parties be opposed to a break, a brief recess? That's fine with us. Okay, let's take a 10 minute break. Okay.
you. Thank you, everybody. Okay, we are back on the record in the Iowa District Court for Jefferson County, State of Iowa versus Willard Chaden Miller. Uh, Mr. Olson, um, you may call your witness. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, I call Annalisa Clifford Gold. Good if I may for the record. Yes. Um, I understand you're probably going to allow this witness, but we're going to object to this is the mother of the defendant, correct? Yes, Scott. Yeah. So the um, the testimony that she's going to offer relates to uh, these allegations that Chapter 232 applies to this case. It's our position that the juvenile code does not apply based on the cases that we have provided to the court. So any testimony she can offer on these issues is not relevant. Uh, that's our position. May I respond, Your Honor? You can. I'm going to let her testify, but if you want to make any record on it, you can. I'll just cite cases in my subsequent briefing, Your Honor. Okay. You can go ahead and call your witness. Thank you, Your Honor. Please raise your right hand. Do you promise or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Please have a seat. Go ahead, Ms. Rolson. Thank you, Your Honor. Annalisa, would you state your name and spell it for the record, please? Annalisa, A-N-N-A-L-I-S-A, -N -N -A Clifford Gold, C-L-I-F-F-O-R-D-G-O-L-D. Who are you in relation to this case? I'm the defendant's mother. That's Jaden? Yes. Have you ever testified before? No. Nervous? Yes. A couple rules for testifying. Let the person ask their full question before you answer, okay? Make sense? Yes. And make sure you answer with a yes or a no or a full explanation to answer the question, okay? Okay. Yeah, because this court reporter has taken down everything that everyone says in the courtroom, okay? Thank you. Okay. And if I ask a question or someone else asks a question that you don't understand, you can ask us to restate it, okay? Okay. Annalisa, have you ever interacted with law enforcement? Have you ever been accused of a crime or a traffic ticket or anything like that before? Traffic ticket. No crimes? No crimes. Does Chaden have any criminal history? No. He, he got in trouble for not wearing a seatbelt in the back seat once. That was it. They didn't take him into a police station and interrogate him for that? No. Your Honor, may I approach the witness? Yes. Annalisa, I just handed you a document that's labeled it's a sealed exhibit. It's triple L for the record. Do you recognize that? I recognize my signature. Is your signature at the bottom? Yes, it is. You signed that document on November 4th of 2021? Yes. Who gave you that document? Richard Vale and Trent Valletta. And do you know who they are in relation to this case? I know that they are DCI. Where were you given that document? Where were you physically? I was at the Jefferson County Law Center in a large office. Okay. Looking at that document, 
there's four items listed up top. Yes. One of the, one of them is they're supposed uh, law enforcement supposed to tell you that your child's in custody. Do you see that part of it? I do. All right. And did you know when you were given that document that that Shaden was in custody? No. Ex uh, why do you say no? Do you want the long answer? <laughs> um what I was told is that all of the students and parents of Noema Graber were being rounded up to try and figure out what had happened, why she had disappeared. I understood that all of the students were together and that the parents were there and that they wanted to be able to talk to the students and they needed my permission to be able to talk to the students. So you didn't understand that Chayden was in custody being held at the point in time when you signed that? No, I thought he was in a room with other students. Let's talk about that second item, the, the delinquent act or, or crime accused. Yes. Did anyone tell you that Nohima Graber had been found dead when you signed that document? No, I knew that she was still missing. Okay. I did you ask anyone about whether or not she had been found? Yes. Um, in the morning at 5.30 when Trent Valletta was in my home, I asked, he indicated that they were trying to resolve what had happened, and I asked him, had she been found, was she okay? And he said, we will explain everything at the police station. Did they explain anything to you at the police station before you signed that document? Not before I signed it. Okay. And that, that uh, discussion with Agent Valletta, that was in, in your home? Correct. And Chayden was still in your home at that time? Correct. There's a part of that document that says that you can confer and speak with your child. Did they tell you that you could go in and talk with Jaden? No. And when I asked, I was told no. Who did you ask? Trent Valletta. And he told you that you couldn't go speak with Jaden? Correct. May also have been Richard Vale. I don't remember exactly. Would you say that again a little clearer, please? It may also have been Richard Vale who told me no. I don't recall which one of the two. I was told no more than once. And at the time you signed that document, did you, is that when they told you no, or was it a different time? Uh, it was both before and after. Did they talk to you at all about getting an attorney for yourself or for Chayden or anyone else? No, in fact, I was advised against it. Explain that. Chauncey Molding recommended I not get an attorney because of the expense that I use the state provided attorney. Okay. That was later though, right? Correct. Okay. That wasn't in regards to signing that document. No. Okay. Talk to me, well, explain to the court. You wear corrective lenses? I do. A document you're looking at, you can read that? I can read it with my glasses on, yes. Okay. Explain to the court eyesight and what you could read and couldn't read on the morning in question, November 4th last year. So in the morning with all the police officers in my home, I was flustered when we were leaving, could not find my correct glasses, found an old pair that I can drive with but I can't read with. When I was given this document, I couldn't read it. And Richard Vale explained to me it just was to allow them to talk to Chayden and, the, and every parent was being asked to sign it um, so that they could talk to all of the students. And they needed a parent's permission to be able to talk to the students. And he drew a line on the bottom and made an X, pushed it in front of me and asked me to sign it. <laughs> And that was Agent Vale who did that? Correct. And I just want to make sure I understand. He said he just needed you to sign that so he could talk to the students? 
to trade him, yes. And he didn't talk to you about any of that information up top? No. Before you signed that form, were you told that Chayden was a suspect in any crime? No. Before you signed that form, were you told that there had even been a homicide? No. Would you have granted permission for law enforcement to speak with Chayden if you knew there had been a homicide? Not without a lawyer present. Would you have granted permission for law enforcement to speak with Chayden if you knew he was a suspect? No, not without a lawyer present. Before you signed that, were you given an opportunity to speak to a lawyer? No. While you were at the Fairfield Police Department, you called for some advice, right? Yes. And that was after you had signed that form? Yes. Can you tell the court if you know or recall what time you spoke with someone for advice? It was at 7.15 a.m. based on my phone log. And is that a phone log for your cell phone? Correct. Who did you speak with? My friend who's a former police detective, Amy Jaffe. Does she live in a different state? She lives in Oregon. Okay. So at approximately 7.13 in the morning, is that what you said? Yes. What happened after that conversation with Ms. Jaffe? During the conversation, I had her on speakerphone. She clarified her credentials to Trent Valletta, and the two of them spoke. Trent filled her in, and she said, you need to shut down the interrogation now. And I looked at Trent Valletta, and I said, yes, now. And Trent said, confirmed, you want me to shut down the interrogation? I said, yes. He got up, he left the room, he returned a few minutes later. I was still on the phone with Amy. Amy, He confirmed that he had shut down the interrogation. And that was at 7.13 in the morning? Correct. And did that happen at the beginning of that conversation? Or, or? Yes, within the first few minutes. Okay. Did you learn anything later on about how long the interview with Jaden went? It went on for hours. Would you say long after you told him to stop it? Yes, long after. Do you know if Chayden had his phone in that interview? Do you know either way? I, he did not. And uh, what I found out later is that it was taken from him while he was still at my home. Okay. So you didn't have any way to communicate with Chayden? No. Other than through law enforcement? Correct. And you were denied access to Chayden by law enforcement? Correct. And you told them to stop the interview, but they didn't? Correct. How old's Chayden? At that time, he was 16. Okay. Just. No further questions at this time, Your Honor. Mr. Brown. Hang on this second, Judge. I'm sorry. Do you have a, is it a hyphenated last name? Is that right? Technically, no. Okay. So your last name is? Two words. Clifford Gold. 
So if I call you Miss Clifford Gold, that's accurate? Correct. Miss <clears throat> um, Clifford Gold, did you uh, go to the law center with the defendant? I did not. Okay. How was it that you were notified that he was at the law center? When all of the officers and the DCI folks were in my home, I was given the option of riding with Chayden or coming on my own. I requested that they get Chayden's father. My intention was that I would go with Chayden um, and that his father would follow. I asked Trent Valletta specifically, does it make a difference if I go with him or on my own? He said, no, it makes no difference. So I said, all right, since I had yet to see Chayden's father, I traveled separately and followed them to the um, police station. So just to kind of flesh out the circumstances a bit more, um, officers came to your home on what day? Was that November the 4th? Correct. Um, did they knock on the door? Yes. All right, and were you asleep at the time? Yes. It was about 5.30 in the morning, is that right? Yes. Uh, were you and your husband uh, both home? No, I'm divorced. I'm, I'm sorry, I apologize. So it was you and who else in the home? Only Chayden. Okay. Uh, and you're divorced from Chayden's father? Correct. All right, and where was he living at the time? Around the corner. Okay, so very near where you and Chayden lived, correct? Yes. All right, did you notify him when officers um, came to your house at 5.30 in the morning? No, I asked them to go and notify them, him. Okay, did they do that? I believe so. Um, was there any show of force by the officers uh, while they were at your house? No. Were they pleasant with you as far as you can describe? Yes. And, and they did go and get um, the defendant's father? Yes. Did he come to your residence? No. Did he meet you at the police station? Or at the law center, I should say? He went to the law center separately. They never allowed him in to meet with me. Okay. Well, I'm talking about Jay, uh, the defendant's father. I am too. Okay. So he went to the law center or he did not? He went to the law center. I had already been admitted to the office with Trent Valletta and with Richard Vale. And he sat in the waiting room waiting to be admitted to come and be with me. And he was not allowed in. At the time that officers came to your home, uh, did you have to wake up your son? No, he was getting ready for a driver's ed course at six o'clock in the morning. So he was already up, is that right? Yes. And was this a driver's ed class that he took um, every day? No, it wasn't every day. Okay, was, how many days a week would he take the driver's ed class? Uh, it, it was an irregular schedule because it was just based on availability to practice driving. Assume it was not unusual for him to be up as early as 5.30 or 6 a.m. in the morning, is that true? When he had a driver's ed lesson, that's true. Okay. Um, you, the form that you've been shown uh, here, the Miranda form uh, that you did sign, correct? Correct. That was signed at your home, is that right? No. Was that signed at the police station? Correct. Okay, sorry. And uh, you had the different glasses on, is that the way I understood? Mm hmm Is that a yes? Yes, that's right. Did, did you tell the officers that you had any difficulty reading the form? I did. Okay, and did they read it to you? No, they just paraphrased that it was to allow them to speak with the students. That's the only explanation they provided you? Correct. And uh, once you're at the law center, um, you know that uh, the defendant, your son, was charged with the murder of Noam Graber, correct? Uh, at 4.15, I was told that. 4.15 p.m.? P.m. Um, 
your son, had he, has he attended Fairfield Public Schools his entire uh, school life? Has he always attended the public school? No. Where, where did he go to school prior? He went to the Maharishi School here also in Fairfield prior to attending. And until his freshman year, is that right? Yes. So freshman year would have been his first year at Fairfield Public Schools? Yes. And um, what year was he at in high school whenever um, this, when the Noe McGraver was killed? Tenth grade. And he had Noe McGraver as a teacher, is that correct? Yes. He had her for Spanish? Yes. Was he struggling in that class? In our objection, I think that we crossed the bounds of relevance to the question of waiver at this point. I think we're getting more into factual allegations and the state's purported motive, and that's outside of what we're at talking about here today. We're talking about the intelligence level of the defendant, um, which goes directly to the voluntariness and whether or not he waived. Oh, oh uh, did you need Mr. Brown to re ask the question? Yes, please. Go ahead. Can I have the camera written back, please? Just make sure I'm accurate. Question, was he struggling in that class? Yes. And was he otherwise a, a pretty good student? Yes. Okay. Did he have A's or B's in the rest of his classes? Pretty much. Okay, so Spanish was the one he was struggling with, is that right? Yes. And I assume he had plans uh, beyond high school, even though he was a sophomore, was he planning on going to college? Yes. And, and do you believe as his parent, he would have had sufficient uh, academic background to at least get admitted into college? Sure, yes. All right, that's all I have to think. Oh, wait, hang on a second. Um, you had indicated that uh, the officers had characterized this as uh, an interview with multiple students. Is that right? Yes. And you thought there were other students or parents, or I'm sorry, other students that were being interviewed at the same time? Yes, like in a group. Okay. Did you see other parents at the law center? No, and I wondered about that. Okay. All right. That's all. Thank you. Mr. Olson. Just a couple of your honor, thank you. Annalisa, that form we're talking about, was that presented to you right when you got to the law enforcement center? No. Uh, maybe a half an hour or something. I don't quite recall, but it wasn't immediate. Okay. Yeah. But all they told you was so that was so they could talk to him? Correct. Didn't talk at all about the rights listed in that top part? No. And is it your understanding that Chayden was not allowed to leave once he got to that police station? Not at all. And is that because any agent or officer told you that? Honestly, I don't, I didn't understand the parameters of anything that was going on. Trent just kept saying, everything will come clear. We're going to explain it soon enough. It wasn't until I wasn't allowed to see him that I realized he personally would be in trouble. And that explanation from Agent Valletta didn't come until long after you signed that form? After I signed it, yes. And you were never allowed to see Chayton, even when you asked? Not until, um, I think it was about nine o'clock. They gave us a couple minutes. Okay. And it was at somewhere shortly after 7.13 in the morning that you told Agent Valletta to stop the interview? Correct. No further questions, John. 
Mr. Brown. Uh, nothing else. Thank you. Ms. Clifford Gold, you can step down. Thank you. Any other witnesses, Mr. Olson? No other witnesses, Your Honor. Uh, counsel, it's my understanding that um, the agreement would be that defense has until November 21st to file a final brief on these issues and that the state would have until November 28th to file the final brief on these matters. Is that correct? That's my understanding. That's my understanding, Your Honor. Any uh, thing else that either side wants to say today? Your Honor, I just very briefly talk about the, the burden. Okay. I think, I think we probably need to make sure the record is clear. Go um, ahead. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, in the motion to suppress, um, well, and first of all, Your Honor, I would ask and, and make sure um, that this court is going to consider all the offered exhibits that are sealed regarding the motion to suppress as well as the motion for Frank's. Um, I cannot recall whether or not that was specifically entered for that purpose. Uh, yes, I, all the exhibits submitted um, for today's hearing, um, the court will consider, and I believe that the state has a copy or my copy of, her, of the interview, is that correct? That's right. I, yeah, just to put that in context, I guess we, they had offered or they indicated this morning that they were going to offer a portion of uh, the defendant's interview. We have the entirety of it, the audio version, which is all of it. Um, in in the, fact, we actually had a uh, certified shorthand reporter do a transcript of that. If that's easier for the court's consideration, we could offer that as well if there's no objection. You know, I can have a brief just off the record discussion with, with opposing counsel. Go ahead. Off the record. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, based on discussions with the state, uh, they have a, it's an audio of the entire interview and a certified transcript. I don't have an objection to either one of those being offered under, as long as it's under seal. Just audio video. You have the audio video. We'll give you the transcript. Uh, okay, so transcripts can be marked as State's Exhibit 4? Yes, sir. Okay, so I'll admit State's Exhibit 4. Um, and uh, all the exhibits submitted today were uh, filed under seal, so that will include states one through four. Go ahead, Mr. Olson. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, as we discussed in chambers, um, it's the state's burden um, to show that it was a knowing and voluntary waiver of the right to remain silent and the right to an attorney um, by Chayden. Uh, this court has heard testimony on that, uh, but it is the state's burden to show that it was knowing and voluntary. Um, and regarding the evidence, I believe that, that shows that it was not knowing or voluntary. And of course, I will provide further argument and citation in, in the brief that will be submitted. Regarding the other three arguments on suppression, um, there were warrants involved. Therefore, those are Mr. Miller's burden to, sh to invalidate that warrant as provided in briefing, those warrants contain both conclusory statements not supported by fact and also fail to indicate credibility of individuals relied on by law enforcement. They don't sufficiently describe why a cell phone and a computer should be seized. They don't have a nexus to those.
and they're overly broad, asking for more information and more places to search than should have been. We'll detail further in briefing, but, Your Honor, those arguments are Mr. Miller's burden, and the briefing will provide that, support the motion, and show this court why those search warrants should be invalidated, why they violated Mr. Miller's constitutional rights and statutory rights, and why the government illegally and unconstitutionally seized evidence. Thank you. Mr. Brown, Mr. Mullen. Judge, um, I think we filed a fairly detailed uh, resistance, at least to the those uh, issues that uh, are the defendant's burden here. I won't restate them for the record. Uh, the standard that applies in reviewing the four search warrants uh, is found in paragraph four of our resistance. Um, we don't believe that the uh, warrants should be invalidated as the defendant has put them or has put it, we believe there is a probable cause and a nexus uh, between the things to be searched and things to be seized uh, as is required by law, as well as it addresses the um, issue of uh, JB being in the confidential informant as alleged by the defense. And also I believe our resistance covers the uh, issue relating to the chapter 232, the juvenile code not applying under these circumstances, which certainly addresses the testimony here from the defendant's mother. So um, I would assume in, once we get the brief from the defense, we will address the voluntariness uh, issue. Um, we believe that the appropriate Miranda warnings were read to the defendant, actually it exceeded them. Uh, what the officers were required to do, he clearly understood them, initialed them, waived his Miranda rights, uh, was calm during the interview, answered questions, uh, was coherent. Uh, it will be obvious from the audio that all of those things are supported. Um, uh, Agent Kedley's testimony is supported by that. So the, the, the Miranda warning is uh, voluntarily waived by the defendant. Whether or not his mother wanted to talk to him, whether or not she tried to get in the room or told the officers to terminate it, makes no difference in this circumstance because of the nature of the offenses that are being investigated by the police. That's the state's position. Um, he is treated as an adult. That's the way it works uh, in, in Iowa when it comes to that particular issue. So for those reasons, we'll uh, submit a, in writing uh, in more detail uh, that would support uh, those arguments uh, that we believe the motion should be overruled. Okay, go ahead, Mr. Olson. No response to that. Um, just one final request, Your Honor. Okay. Um, I'd ask the court to um, allow the specific um, filing regarding our Frank's preliminary hearing to be filed under seal since it will discuss the specifics of those sealed um, exhibits that the court now has. I would ask permission that we file that under seal and ask that any response from the state also be filed under seal so the specific information is not in the public until such time that it may or may not be used at trial. The state. Have a well, just a point of clarification. Are we also brief? We're briefing the Franks issue as well. I thought the court had the information with regard to the Franks issue, and you're going to make a determination concerning the, the threshold question that you have to address. If that is in favor of the defense, then we're going to have a, another hearing yeah. uh, that will get much more uh, detailed, which will be an open court, I would uh, point out, uh, where we'll get into a lot of detail with regard to all those things that relate to that. So I'm not really sure what, he, what they're asking. It, it relates to the suppression issue. I thought that's what we were, we were providing further briefs on, not Frank's. Go ahead, Mr. Olson. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, I have asked for just an opportunity to cite to specific parts of those exhibits that support our Frank's motion, those exhibits that are not yet, that, that have, are just recently being added to the record. I asked to be able to provide, I think I called it a roadmap for this court. So this court isn't 
at being asked to read an entire deposition or watch hours and hours of transcript. But citing those specific parts of the record require describing why I think they're important for our Frank's preliminary showing. That's what I that's what I'm asking to be put under seal, not a not a full briefing, okay. just cite just specific discussion of the facts. So the suppression will be what is briefed. The Franks, uh, you'll uh, provide information to the court to what to focus on. Is that what you're requesting? Yes, Your Honor. Any objection from the state? Is there, is there a difference between those two things? Yes. <laughs> so I'll grant your request. Thank you, Your Honor. And we'll have till the 21st, you'll have till the 21st and the state will have till the 28th for briefing on the suppression motion. Anything else for the record, counsel? I believe so, Your Honor. Not from the state, no. No, Your Honor. Okay. We'll close the record.